She just told me it's time to go to talk. Okay. Wow. Thank you for coming. It's quite the audience. All right. So um, we're not videoing this, right? Just the slides. Awesome. Because then I can do what I normally do, which is walk back and forth while I talk. Um, so welcome to Measure Twice, Code run Once. For those of you who've ever done carpentry, Measure Twice, Cut Once. Um, I would walk more, but Dan has put tables in the way to prevent me from getting back and forth across the stage. Uh, this is work that I've been doing uh, over the last, actually, I guess we've been doing this a little under a year, with Jim Thompson from NetGate, uh, trying to look at various things in network performance and FreeBSD. Um, so benchmarks are hard, it turns out. <clears throat> Unless you're a marketing department, then they're really easy, uh, because you just make up numbers, you put them on a slide. I do not work for marketing, so I mostly did not make, my, make up my numbers. But if I did, you can call me on it, because I've also put my numbers into a GitHub repository. Um, why are they harder? Well, there's a whole bunch of questions we have to ask, and we have to answer them correctly to get a good benchmark. Like, what are we trying to measure? How are we going to measure it? How do we verify our measurements? People often get through the first two questions pretty well. Sometimes they do anyway. Uh, and then they get the third one wrong, because they're like, well, I've got a measurement. Why would I have to run that you know, thing more than once? What do you mean by statistical significance? Um, can our measurement be repeated? Sorry, wrong button. Uh, can our measurement be repeated? Right, that's really important. You know, many people have made measurements of, for instance, cold fusion. But if no one else can uh, you know, do that same measurement, then no one's going to believe you. Or no one with any brains will believe you. Uh, can we replicate it somewhere else? Um, is our measurement relevant? This is a question that many people do not ask themselves. So it's like, I've measured this thing, and it does blah. And it's like, well, that's great. And now I've added 5% to that. That's great. But we didn't care about that. Right? So it has to be relevant to what you're doing. Um, how do we generate workloads? Right? So you know, there's all kinds of ways of generating workloads, synthetic, non-synthetic. You know, for those of us who do a lot of networking stuff, which is what I mostly do and what the talk is about, um, it's really hard to simulate the internet. I mean. <laughs> You can get a lot of cats in a room and a photographer, but other than that, it's difficult to simulate the internet. Um, so figuring out how to generate a workload that's going to be representative when you put, some, you know, because you're usually doing this because you want to put something out as a product or as an open source operating system that's going to be used by someone other than you, uh, you workload generation and how you generate that also becomes important. And there are people, by the way, in the world who will sell you fabulously expensive objects with which to generate workloads. Um, and if you don't know what you're trying to generate, you'll spend a lot of money and not get a very good result. And even if you do know what you're doing, sometimes you'll spend a lot of money and not get a very good result. Um, and here's the last one that I really like. Um, so most people know what a Heisen bug is, right? So when I look for the bug, the cat is alive. When I don't look for the bug, the cat is dead. Um, in testing, we also have Heisen testing, right? So we set up a measurement. We're running, you know, we set up a workload. We've got something that's detecting what that workload looks like. But that detection software itself may actually disturb the thing that you're trying to measure. And if you're doing that, you are going to pull out all of your hair. That's a joke I make in every talk. Um, so here's a long list of reasons why benchmarks are hard. I will start hitting the right button at some point. Um, network benchmarks are harder uh, for a smaller, happily, number of reasons. Uh, asynchrony is the key reason. right? So if I'm trying to test something on a local system, and all of the hardware is working properly, which it mostly does, then I can run that test repeatedly without worrying too much about asynchronous events interrupting me. But in networking, a lot of stuff is asynchronous, and so we have to worry about that asynchrony. We also have to worry about loss, because um, most networking is best effort delivery, which is why I love working on networking. Because you know, as Kirk says, if he's here, he's in another talk. When Kirk talks about file systems, he'll say, um, if you ever curdle someone's data, they'll never trust you again on a file system. But it turns out in networking, I can drop your packets day and night, and you'll keep giving me them. They're like 50% of your packets went away. You're like, no, take more, take more, take more. So best effort delivery actually makes it difficult to, to come up with good network benchmarks and network testing, uh, because you've, you, know, you are not guaranteed they will all get there. And so there's another thing to count, another thing you have to worry about. And if you do silly things like you know, ramp your uh, request rate, rate up very high very soon, you'll discover just how best effort best effort is. Um, 
There's a real lack of open source test tools. I do a lot of open source. I mean, my God, I'm wearing open source clothing all week. Um, so there's a lack of really good open source test tools. Many people, for some reason, and I know I've done this too, you know, you're like, oh, I got to test this network thing. I'm going to build like a client and a server that are really simple and they count packets. And everyone gets that far. <clears throat> and then they put it on, well, they used to put it somewhere else. Now it's on GitHub, right? So there's, you know, 12 of these things, many of which no one's actually ever verified if they work correctly. So my favorite one of this was the early versions of NetPerf, which was one of these client server testers. Um, a mathematician come up to me who also does, does crypto, actually. He's like, you realize that those results are like always off by 30% one way or the other. I'm like, well, no. He's like, yeah, here's some math. I'm like, wow, well, okay, I'll stop using that. Um, so there's a lack of these open source test tools. And then, you know, we all know that open source is of uneven quality, right? So you have to pick the right test tools. Um, and then there's this problem of distributed control. So I'm going to talk a little bit more of that in, in some upcoming slides. You know, if you happen to have a test lab and you happen to have some minions, I think we call them remote hands, but, you know, and you can get them to move things around and do all that kind of stuff, then you can say, well, you know, I want to test this today and I move these things around and I want to test this today. Or you buy a very expensive box where it's like guiding light with switches and I don't have one of those. <clears throat> um, you've got to control your distributed systems that you're testing. Again, in the single system test case, you can sit in front of the computer, whatever that computer is, or you could log into a terminal or whatever and you can run the thing, and you don't have to tell this person to talk to this person while this person listens and this person watches and that kind of thing. So control of distributed systems makes networking benchmarks more difficult to control and set up. Um, here's a typical lab. This happens to be a lab hosted at Syntax. If Mike Tanska is here somewhere, I'm destroying his last name. I really wish he'd raise his hand because <laughs> Mike is the um, co-owner of Syntax who have hosted the uh, FreeBSD projects, network test lab, high performance network te test lab here in Canada for the last, for many years. Um, and so a lot of this is wired up by him and another guy who works with him, Paul Holes, who are amazing remote hands. And you only discover how amazing remote hands are until you don't have them. And they're like, wow, <laughs> you guys actually know what you're doing. Uh, so this is a typical test setup for uh, packet forwarding testing, which I'm going to show a little bit of that. Uh, you got a source. You can ignore the names, or you could find them on the wiki page, by the way. All this is documented on, our, on the external wiki for FreeBSD. I got a source of sync, a bunch of 10 gig cards from this company, Chelsea, whose developer is there, um, and he's very helpful. And then we've got a control network where we're using the Intel you know, 1 gigs to just talk to the things. <clears throat> and then we've got this uh, Arista 10 gig switch. Um, up at the top, so we can do, we can either go through the device under test, you'll see DUT a lot, um, or we can go, you know, over this network and remove the device under test and see what we would get in this case. So this is a typical, you know, three system lab setup. People who work for large companies that do a lot of networking have really awesome labs and, like I said, a lot of remote hands to work on them. I don't. I have a couple of remote hands that are excellent and some really, we've probably got about, foundations put, something like 20 or 20, 20 some odd machines with high performance networking stuff into the Centex lab. And a lot of the cards have been donated by the vendors. So now whenever a vendor comes to me and says, we've got a new NIC, I say, give me two, right? Because it turns out that in network testing, you really want two at least. <laughs> um, and considering I've burned out a couple of cards, I probably should start asking for three, but usually we get two. In this case, we've got more. <laughs> yes, exactly, oh, you know, two, four, eight. 16, some power of two. Um, so there's a typical setup just for one test. This is not the whole lab, but this is how a lot of the tests were run. So here's another thing that's important in benchmarks, which again, people leave out. What did you benchmark with, right? What was the hardware you benchmarked on? You know, and really specific, because it turns out if you've been to any of the discussions in the last couple of days about sort of NUMA and multi-core, or if you see any of this stuff, you realize from generation to generation, it really matters, you know, this model number actually matters because that's how all of the hardware is arranged. So in a lot of the tests I've done uh, and that I'm going to present today, we've got a uh, source and a sink or these dual socket 10 core 2.8 gigahertz. I think they actually heat the room pretty well, uh, Xeon Monsters. And then we put us, you know, a four core but fast machine in the middle. We're using Chelsea T520s, dual port 10 gig NICs and an Arista 7124. And the reason you put this up here isn't just to show, wow, you've got really cool hardware. 
It's more, well, if you wanted to replicate this, you could replicate this exactly with this if you happen to pick up that hardware. Or you could at least figure out maybe analogous hardware so you could see if your analogous results were analogous. Because if they're not, that's a problem. So let's talk a little bit, take a little side trip into coffee land. You can only imagine what the recording of this is like. Um, and talk a bit about modern hardware. So one of the reasons we set up Centex and we got people to donate hardware and we got the foundation to put in servers uh, and power and cooling and yada, 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 is uh, you know, 10 gig hardware is still somewhat expensive. Um, I like to say that it's now gotten cheap enough to be within the means of even the smallest nuclear power. Um, but when you're running 10 gig hardware, you've got some numbers to deal with, right? So 10 gigabits, you get 14.8 14 14 .8 million 64 byte packets per second. You get about 200 cycles of 300 gigahertz to deal with the packet. That's a very interesting problem, because I don't know about you, but when was the last time you found one of your functions took less than 200 nanoseconds? Or 200 cycles, sorry, not 200, 67 nanoseconds. Um, Another interesting problem that we come across as we get to these newer machines, um, the cost of a cache miss is way more expensive than anything else that's going to go wrong on the system. Right? So we used to be taught to program, and many, many of us were taught to program, such that you um, optimized for CPU cycles. CPU cycles are not, not quite free. I mean, I know Java programmers think they are, <laughs> along with memory. But um, cache misses are what cost now. If you blow out of the cache, your network performance will suffer, and I can show you that happening. Um, other things that matter on modern hardware are multi-core. Uh, so you know, it used to be you had one processor with one core, and that was not so bad. And then you had one processor with two cores and four cores, and now you can buy an 18-core uh, you know, processor from Intel, which has a complicated little ring network in it that's sort of terrifying. Um, so multi-core matters. You need to think about what's going on in a multi-core machine because where you put your workload is going to affect your benchmark result. And if you don't look out for that, you're going to either, you're going to confuse yourself badly. Uh, Multi-queue, so all of the network cards. The way you get a 10 gig network card to do 10 gig is you, most, you often will use multiple queues. I mean, sometimes you can do it with one queue, but you really can't. So they're like, look, we got all this silicon. <clears throat> we'll spread the load. So how you line things up, last line, between memory, your queues, and your cores has a very profound effect on the results you're going to see from a benchmark. So these are the things to keep in mind when we're doing network performance benchmarks. So I mentioned the problem of distributed systems. And what I love about open source, which I'll point out in this, is you know all of us have a scratch, a scratch to itch, an itch to scratch. And mine, when I started doing some of this work, was this, which is this coordination problem. I don't want to have to have, even though I often do, you know, 15 terminals open where I have a bunch of command lines ready and I have to go return, 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 return to run a test. That's just ridiculous, right? But I've done that before. So I wrote this thing called Conductor, uh, which is a set of Python libraries. It's in pure Python, uh, which someone was like, wow, that's great. I'm like, it's not that hard. Anyway, um, so you have a conductor. And for those who know me in the audience, not a train conductor, um, this is you know this is the conductor conductor thing, right? So there's a conductor in one or more players. So you can have as many players as you like, and they all talk to each other. And the conductor is the one that sets the tune, right? You are going to do this, and then this, and then this. Um, and the test system has four phases: start up, run, collect, and reset, right? And the reset thing is kind of important because this is another thing people often forget when they're running multiple tests, which is well, I've set up the test. But now I've got a bunch of state that accrued because I ran the test, and then I collected the results. And now that state influences the next round. Oh, by the way, you should test more than once, just in case you didn't know. Um, you kind of want to have statistically significant numbers instead of just a one-off. So this is a system we did up in you know, Python open source. It's on GitHub. I'll put all the links up later. Uh, there were two nice things about doing this. One, it saved me from typing return in a bunch of windows. And the moment you publish something in open source, five people come forward and go, you know, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> I got mails from there. I got mail from someone in this. Nope, he's not here. Uh, but I got some mail from someone at the conference or someone they work with saying, oh, we did this for TCP. I'm like, really? Where is it? They're like, well, we, we're not ready to release it yet. I'm like, well, then that doesn't help me. Um, 
But it does get people to, I like doing this because it gets people to sort of release these internal things that are like, nobody would ever want this. No, no, <laughs> we really do. Um, so I'll go through this little di uh, digression through conductor, here's a config. This is what the conductor sees. It's like, where are my clients? Where are the config files? Uh, notice one, that's not a good set of trials. Uh, but this is testing, so testing the testing. Um, here's a player config. Uh, if Steve Bourne is in the room, you'll notice that this is a ridiculously horrible version of just a bunch of shell commands. So I should probably adopt a shell scripting language. But I got a little too far into it. I've got line numbers. See, they're called steps. <laughs> <laughs> Told you it was primitive, but nobody else had one until I published this. And suddenly, four people or five people are like, all right, we got that. Uh, anyway, it's pretty simple. You know, where do, we, where do we find our conductor? Where do we find the master? Uh, what do we do when we start up? You know, why do we do a ping when we start a test? That's a good one. What's another reason? Yes, ARP cache. You don't want to be testing whether or not you've loaded the ARP cache, at least not in this particular test. Um, got a run thing. We're collecting a bunch. Of, this is on one of the devices under test. So one of the things that you can do once you've got something like this is you can not only run the tests on, you know, from source to sync, but while the machine is running, you can start collecting uh, performance analysis stuff. So this is doing a bunch of looking for the instructions retired on the system as it's trying to forward packets. So then you can find the hot point in the kernel, which I can tell you where that is. Um, there are a few. So, and then we collect the results. So this is just an example. There's a whole bunch of these. I'll give you another pointer. All of the, I'll give you another pointer at the end, but all the work we're doing when we're doing the performance stuff. Uh, Conductor is open source and on GitHub, and there's a project under, they're all under GVNN3, which is my GitHub login, because I couldn't get GNN. Um, and then all of the tests and results and config files for the things I'm going to show you are in something called NetPerf. Right, there's a little NetPerf project that you can clone and you can see what I've done wrong, because I really like people to start <laughs> looking at that. So, baselines. Um, many people, when they want to run a benchmark, the first thing they test is the thing they know their boss wants, right? The boss wants to know that NFS performance is 20% faster, or that you know TCP does this, or UDP does that, or whatever it is. They're testing for a specific thing, but they don't establish a baseline, right? And establishing a baseline turns out to be really important because then you don't have it. Otherwise, you have nothing to measure against. You just give someone a number. It's fast, great, faster than uh, so. In establishing uh, some of the baseline measurements that I'll talk about, we used, actually it's iPerf3, I should put the three on, um, which by the way is now maintained by a former FreeBSD developer, so that makes my life easy because I can get him to put in patches. Um, iPerf3 is a TCP-based test that seems to give reasonably statistically significant results as opposed to NetPerf. Um, your old NetPerf, not the new NetPerf. Um, the new NetPerf, so uh, Luigi Rizzo added this thing called NetMap, which you may have heard about. And if you haven't, it'll be talked about at every BSD conference for the next five years. So you will hear about it. It's also in this book that I worked on. Um, NetMap gives you direct access to the very lowest levels of a network interface card's device driver. And what that allows you to do is to drive that card pretty much at line rate without interference from the network stack. Right? So if you are doing packet type tests, Something like NetPerf is something you really want because you can just pump packets out at line rate at 10 and 40 gig, and I've tested this on 10 and 40 gig already. Um, and that's a really good way to abuse the living crap. I guess I'm recorded. But anyway, to abuse the living crap out of a device under test, whereas TCP has so much other things going on that what you'll really find is it's all good or uh, everything is fine. Right? As we say on the FreeBSD project, everything is fine. Well, that's because all the machinery has smoothed out all the rough edges for you. If you want to put the rough edges back, you use NetPerf. So here's a baseline TCP measurement. Um, this is just a host-to-host -host between the switch. Um, no forwarding going on through the, the host. You notice that iPerf's reporting this like every second for 10 seconds. Uh, it's saying, wow, well, getting really consistent 9.41 gig gigabits per second. So. Talk is over, we can go home now. <laughs> um, so the talk is not over and we cannot go home. But, so this is the baseline when we just turn things on. So now we've got something to work against uh, in terms of what do we get host to host when we're not doing forwarding. A lot of the tests 
that I've been doing lately look at the forwarding path of FreeBSD, which is something that people have not looked at as much recently because people assume you don't use FreeBSD as sort of a router, or a, um, you know, directly in the in the packet path. But a lot of people do, it turns out. And the better it gets, the better we will be. Besides, it's fun. Um, so we saw 9.4 gigabits per second with TCP. I really should put commas in here. Um, see the source? See the sync? They don't match. Why is that? Um, that's because this is the packet gen measurement. This is just raw packet performance. All right, and so somewhere we are losing packets. And part of the exercise is to find out where. So why we see this is eventually TCP very quickly ramps up to full-size packets, which are much easier for everyone to process. Uh, including you know, the NIC and the operating system because you're not dealing with 64 bytes at a time. Packetgen uses minimum size packets and the device under test can't quite keep up, as you noticed. Um, but if we hadn't done the baseline, we'd be like, well, you know, if we had done the baseline and accepted that we were done, uh, we would not know very much. And we'd think, it's all, everything is fine, which it's not. Um, one of the interesting things I find about the minimum size packet trick so many network testing systems, you know, especially the expensive ones, and many people who build network cards that are selling them to you are really big on like, we can do X minimum size packets per second. And it's like, that's great. Um, there's only one real use of minimum size packets, X. Now, if you happen to be, I don't know, feeding 40, gig 40 gigabits of TCP to people's televisions, you probably care about the ACK rate coming back. Um, but this is not, this is just sort of the worst case, but it's not, also, it's not always the most interesting case. We'll take a, take a look at that in a little bit. And hmm? And VoIP. And VoIP. But I don't know. How fast do you speak? <laughs> yes. No, I understand. Um, so that was some of the baseline measurements we did just for TCP and for packet forwarding. I want to talk about some of the more recent work uh, that we've done since, so I've, uh, since we did the initial work on forwarding. It's expensive. Uh, clearly the spell checker did not catch that. Um, IPSEC and its algorithms. So we have IPSEC and FreeBSD. Uh, we use it, and many people use it. Um, you know, we know that, uh, Cripsec, that IPSEC and encryption are computationally expensive, often offloaded through coprocessors. If you saw John Mark's talk uh, before lunch, then you saw the work that he's done to bring the AES and I instructions into FreeBSD as a way of accelerating the encryption part. So one of the things to do once John Mark had gotten that in the head was to then see, well, how much does that help? Or my real question, having looked at IPSEC, which is actually pretty good, um, but the thing I wanted to know is what is the weight of the framework, right? So when you introduce some framework like IPSEC or a TCP stack or whatever, you put some extra software around things to make it work, before you go figuring out how fast did that screamingly fast new instruction from Intel make things go, you've got to sort of figure out, well, what happens when we're not doing anything at all? And by not anything at all, I do not mean no IPSEC, I mean uh, using the null stuff. So here's our measurement method for this. This is a two host test um, with either transport or tunnel mode for IPSEC, depending on what we were doing. Um, and using the same machines you saw in the lab, uh, we used IPERF3 to do TCP testing over the IPSEC uh, transporter tunnel between those two hosts, between Lynx1 and Rabbit3. And again, all the results, all the configs, they're all up in the NetPerf uh, GitHub. So two hosts set up IPerf3. Obviously, I used Conductor because everyone else hasn't released their awesome open source software. Um, and then a very simple test, 10 rounds, 10 seconds each to try and you know, make sure I'm not completely lying with just one result. So what do we get for a baseline? Uh, and remember, this is two 10 gig NICs. So, um, using null encryption, we actually have null encryption, which someone broke because <clears throat> no one tests. And uh, so I put the null encryption back. Why did I put null encryption back? Because I don't want anything interfering. I want to know the speed of the baseline framework. I want to know what is the cost of just turning on IPSEC. 
Um, so no authentication, no encryption. And one of the things that happens when we use IPsec is you lose a bunch of the things that make 10 gig cards go fast. 10 gig cards go fast not because there's a little man running very quickly in them. Um, <laughs> because they're water-cooled, which they will be eventually. I keep seeing NIC cards that look like old-style graphic cards, and I'm waiting for them to have that, like, that lime wire that, on them and bubbling water. Um, so when you turn off TCP segment offloading and uh, you know, hardware checksumming and uh, large receive offload, it turns out the cards are not so screamingly fast anymore. So this is the result of running null. Um, the result of running not null, but just um, you know the 10 gig cards with, with none of the features is only about, uh, I think it's like 40% more than this. I'm still working on that result. So this is the baseline we get with IPsec on, 2.4 uh, uh, gigabits per second between two hosts um, running TCP you know, all day, all night. Um, so with IPsec, we've got authentication and encryption. You can pick one or the other or both. Um, you should always pick both, just saying. Um, but you know, so what's, what's the effect of turning on something like HMAC SHA-1, which is actually kind of expensive computationally? So this is transport mode. There's no encryption. This is hundreds of megabits a second on a 10 gig link. Right? So we are less than 10% of the effective bandwidth between the two hosts. That is not good. <coughs> Um, but we're not going to get to why today. Actually, to get to the why, you're going to have to come to another talk. Teasers. Um, and then one of the new modes that um, John Mark has added is this AES and I stuff. And one of the algorithms that takes advantage of it is AES GCM, which is Galois counter mode, I think. OK, excellent. I got it right. I even probably, did I say Galois correctly? Yes. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> um, so this is running in tunnel mode, where you know your complete packet is encapsulated. There's a whole another header on the front. Everything is hidden from everyone but maybe the NSA. <clears throat> That's recorded too. Uh, so we've got both encryption and authentication. And what happens when we go between using no hardware support? Which, if you thought that authenticating was expensive, encrypting is super super expensive, but really secure. Um, and then you get what is it, like five times the number of uh, bits through once you turn on the hardware support. We're actually within half the speed of our original baseline. Our original baseline was 2.4 at max. Uh, we get to 1.3 at max with the ASNI support. So um, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. This is, well, what do we have? What did we get? And now the next thing we're going to work on, and I'm not going to present today, is what else can we do? But one of the things that um, yeah, here, I'll leave up the overall picture while I rant about uh, premature optimization. So I don't know if you know this, but hubris is an issue for software engineers, except me. Um, <laughs> and so we all think we're smarter than the compiler, the hardware, everyone who's ever looked at anything. Um, and often people will look at a very narrow chunk of code and say, oh, I could make that faster. And I'm like, but does it matter? This comes back to the relevancy question I brought up in the, second, or the first real slide. Um, in order to know whether things are relevant, you have to have this kind of set of measurements first. right? And then you can be like, well, OK. We know that hard versus soft, that using the hardware versus the software version is, is much faster. We know that it's still not even up to what null is, which, you know, OK, we know we have to do some work. That's good. But we also know that null is not at the speed that perhaps it could be. So um, we want to find out why, right? And when I showed you the config file for the device under test, you saw I was starting to add PMC, which is the performance monitoring counter system. Um, I've done a bit of analysis also with Dtrace. And that's the kind of stuff that's going to tell us why. Now that we've got a framework in place and a set of software that can run the tests, and it's all out in the open for people to use, we can start digging down into why. Um, and maybe the why is, you know, Sometimes you look at the hardware and you look at what's going on, and you just find out that you have reached the limit of the hardware. I do not for a moment believe that this is the limit of the hardware. Um, I think that there are limitations in the software. But uh, to find that out, come to VBSDCon 
in the fall outside of Washington, D.C., and you'll see what the results of the Y tests are. So last big set of tests. Um, this is work we had done a bit earlier. Uh, Jim and his team work a great deal with PF. They work on PF Sense. Uh, so we want to try and figure out, well, what is the you know, overall performance of PF Sense, raw FreeBSD, OpenBSD's PF, which is where PF's you know, where FreeBSD's PF originally comes from, but there's been a great deal of work in particular to make it multi-core uh, on FreeBSD. And then I, there's this other operating system, which I dare not speak its name. Um, the firewall rules are given in the paper we presented at Asia BSDCon 2015. I'm not going to make you read firewall rules on a slide. I'm not that mean. Um, so we went through, a, and actually Jim ran a bunch of this stuff, and we, we worked through this. Um, we went through a bunch of scenarios, right? And that's the kind of thing that you're designing when you do good benchmarks. You don't just pick one thing and go, look, this number is 5, right? You know, like, this number is 5 when all of the other variables were controlled in the following way. So first thing we do is some single core, no filtering. What no filtering means is there's no real rule. We've just turned the thing on, and, you know, PF or IP tables or whatever is or what have you, it looks at every packet. So that bit of framework is being touched every time, which is definitely an overhead, right? You touch a packet, you look at a byte, you invalidate a cache, you, you know, thing, things happen. Um, bad things happen to bad people. So how did it go? So this is a, a packet per second measurement. This is a very common network benchmarky thing. Um, instead of measuring just raw bits per second, it's like number of packets per second. Uh, and in this case, it turns out in single core, without filtering, um, PFSense is faster than OpenBSD, which is faster than FreeBSD, which is faster than CentOS. Hooray, BSDs! All three are ahead of Linux. <laughs> Yay! Um, then we turn filtering on. <coughs> uh, and in single core with filtering, current doesn't do so well. But it does come in just behind Linux, which is how we like to really position the BSDs, right? We're just behind Linux. <laughs> um, so again, even with filtering, uh, PFSense is ahead of OpenBSD. Um, you see that we've got these standard deviations in packets per second. So you're going to see a really wild one in a bit that I haven't been able to beat into submission. Um, so PFSense, OpenBSD, CentOS, FreeBSD current. And this is current as of February, I should probably put the date on the slides at this point, February uh, 2015. So, you know, we talked about modern hardware very early on in the talk, right? It turns out multi-core really matters, um, unless you, you know, don't want to do anything. So we turn on multi-core, and things get very bad for the BSDs, <clears throat> um, because CentOS basically is ahead of everything, right? And now PFSense is only just behind Linux. Um, but FreeBSD is not just behind Linux. And OpenBSD is really not just behind, right? And what you'll notice here that's interesting, there's a not applicable um, to the speed up, right? We know why that is, right? We know that PF and OpenBSD is not multi-threaded, or it was not when these in 5.6 when these were done. Um, but it does show that it matters. They do get about mm, 1,000 extra packets, so not so good. Um, so now we've done multi-core with, without filtering. This is, we're just touching, you know, the framework touches the packet, but there's no rules being executed. Nobody's looking at the rules. The packets just flow through the machine. A couple of counters go up, and, you know, cache lines get invalidated. What happens when you turn on filtering? Well, not so good. Um, now PFSense is not so close to Linux. FreeBSD is really not close to Linux or PFSense, and OpenBSD isn't close to anything but the ground. Um, it's a very bad moment for everyone in sports. In fact, what's interesting here to me in the OpenBSD case is that even turning on multiple cores seem to have very slightly negatively impacted performance. I don't think this is stati statistically significant, but it was, I'm like, if you've got no multi-core sort of thingies in the way, what's going on? So there might be something odd there. Um, but then you also notice this, right? So in the single core case with filtering on, um, CentOS would not have been at the top. But once you get here, clearly the IP table stuff has been well-optimized for the multi-core case, which, other than 
a very small number of people, and certainly not people who'd build like a home router, uh, everyone's got multiple cores. Just my watch has multiple cores. I, that is actually true for once, right? It's a new watch. Um, <laughs> my toaster does not yet. So, you know, what is what are some of the lessons to take away from this, right? Well. This gives us some answers and more questions, right? We now know what the state of play is, right? What does the field look like if we want to improve, you know, TF in any of the BSDs, OpenBSD or the version that we now have in FreeBSD? We know where we stand um, related re in relation to other systems, and we know that we have work to do. Um, even if we won, whatever winning means, um, we and unless we were doing exactly line rate, which I would have considered to be a statistical error. Um, we know we have work to do. So there's answers, but more questions, which is what always happens when you do these. Well, what should always happen when you do a benchmark, right? If you come to the end of the benchmark and you're like, yep, no more questions. I'm like, really? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, you might not want to do more work, but there are always more questions. Uh, turns out uh, multi-core matters. Getting multi-core right, i.e. fast multi-core primitives, matters even more, right? So the, you know, the top end Haswell core you know, system is an 18 core system uh, with two rings in it between the cores. And if you think that is where we're going to stop, you're wrong. Uh, for anyone who saw, who was at the Dev Summit yesterday and saw some of the ARM stuff, those are 48, uh, was it 40, 32 core, 48 core, 48 core? I missed it. But uh, <laughs> I had to talk to someone. Multi-core really matters. Felt doing it fast really matters. Um, you know, why is IP tables the fastest? Right, so one of the things that I that we're going to need to do next, or we, basically me, unless someone else wants to volunteer, is to dig into, you know, why the Linux stuff is faster. Is it do they use RCU because they can get away with it? I mean, because IBM lets them. Um, is there something they're doing there that's you know just better? And can we learn from them? Um, I wouldn't use the word steal. So and you know. Why does FreeBSD lag PFSense when PFSense is based on FreeBSD? So what did, you know, what did the people who were working on something that really was a, a, you know, a firewall do to improve their performance? That's actually pretty important. All right, so here's the full picture. When's the last time anyone drew a bar graph? Jim drew this. It was very good. I was really happy because he, I was like, I don't know how this works. Um, this is more useful when we're going to look at what we're doing next. But you can see that this is everyone lined up, right? So um, it's PFSense, OpenBSD, FreeBSD 11 uh, as of February, and then CentOS 7, which is the Linux IP table stuff, right? And you know, now you've got a picture. This is what it looks like when you're trying to do you know, software-based firewalls on an open source operating system, which is something we're not giving up. I mean, as it was pointed out to me the other day, FreeBSD still has three firewall systems, right? Um, uh, yeah, that's my plan. That's, that's <laughs> exactly. The question was, why am I going to work on another one? Like, yes, because I know that I can do so much better than, no, I'm not going to work on another one. Um, I think I'm going to fix whatever we decide to use next. So um, this is what we call a longitudinal study. So I have a thing for performance analysis. One might say an unhealthy interest. Um, and you know, now that we've got the hardware and we've got some more software to, to run it, uh, the idea is to make this into a continuous longitudinal study. We will publish different things about different bits of the kernel. Like I said, we're going to talk about the why of some of the stuff you saw today when we get to the VBSDCon uh, presentation, which has been accepted. So that means I have to do the work. Um, the idea is to try and report this several times a year. Uh, since I wind up at a couple of uh, BSD conferences a year, that seems to make sense. Uh, we want to cover more subsystems. So one of the things that I plan to do for the VBSD con presentation is not just look at the whys of IPSEC and try to do some more performance improvement there. Uh, but if you've ever worked on FreeBSD, you know that we have packet forwarding and fast packet forwarding. And you might ask yourself why you would ship a system that has the knob that says fast turned off. <laughs> As a fact, I frequently ask myself this question. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to look at between now and, and the fall is uh, my goal is to basically collapse the two and to take the things that were made fast in the fast case, move them up where they should be in the slow case, and take the fast case out and, well, yes. 
<clears throat> take the fast case out. So uh, we're going to look at that. Uh, another thing that we're, I want to look at is IPFW, right? Um, maybe eventually I'll look at IP filter if someone doesn't remove it before I have to. Um, people keep saying. But uh, IPFW is another comparison I'd like to make because IPFW's architecture is completely different to the way that PF works. So if you've read both sets of code, and I did because there's a section in one of the chapters on the two of them, um, their approaches to how they do packet filtering are completely different. Right? How they decide which packets to keep and which packets to throw away and where they throw things into rules and all that stuff. So it would be very interesting to see how those design trade-offs get played out uh, under the study. So I said I'd tell you where to get it. Um, so the netperf work, which is the scripts and the results, are all in this, this thing here. This is called netperf, um, which actually I admit was a really bad name, but it was late, because there's a million things in the internet called netperf, it turns out. Um, but I'm not renaming it now, because it's too much trouble. Uh, here's conductor, so again, under my little thing here. Uh, PFSense, I think you all know where to get FreeBSD as well. Um, and then the other thing I really want to talk about, if you decide you want to do something like this, don't. But if you really decide again that you want to do it, um, you really need to read this book. And actually, uh, Arun Thomas, who was also here, um, pointed out that this book, which was done in 1991, uh, is about to come out in a new version in 2015. This is the book on computer systems performance analysis. Raj Jain is a really good writer. You can read this book before bed and not hit yourself in the head when you drop it on yourself as you fall asleep. It's well written. It's easy to read. Well, set the stats part. Other than that, it's really easy to read. Um, and uh, Jane, uh, Professor Jane now, I guess, uh, is very much a networking person. So a lot of the examples that he uses, some of them are database sort of query optimization thing, query, query measurement stuff. But a lot of it's network based. So if you're interested in particular in network performance analysis, this, this is the book. It's a great, great book. All right. Um, we have about 15, they probably kicked me out a little earlier, so about 15 minutes for questions. Any questions? Way in the back. Hey, Christian. Did you ever, did you ever so the question was, did we consider NPF? And at the time that I started doing this, uh, NPF was a little new, and I did not want to broaden it, but there's no reason not to. Um, we probably should look at it because NPF is also a completely different system. Um, I don't, you're, who's an MPSD person? Raise your hand. I, I won't complain. Is, is anyone know if it's actually multi-core, multi-threaded? Uh, I can't say for sure. Do you know? I mean, I know you do BMake, so. But, all right, so that would be another interesting question. We, we might find it operates about like PF in uh, OpenBSD. Other questions? Wow. Oh. Did you use IPerf3 given the package per second numbers when you actually did the test one, or was that after? What did you use? Package N. Package N. Oh, package N. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was package N. Other questions? Yes. Oh, wait. Ah, Colin and then Mike. So how does one benchmark future length impact packet forwarding and the impact faster than packet forwarding? Yes, so I have done that bit. <laughs> like, <laughs> there is a reason I want to take the lessons for the question was, did, have we run any benchmarks at all on the fast versus non-fast path of packet forwarding? Um, and that was actually in a previous version of the slides, but I wanted to start including the new IPSEC stuff. Uh, yes, if you turn on fast packet forwarding and you don't need certain features that, were that get turned off when you turn it on, uh, which is kind of, you know, it does, the fast packet forwarding path has two things in it. It has a reordering of the way you decide what to do with the packet. That's the thing that should be making it fast. But it also turns off a bunch of things that we check in the normal forwarding case. So the question is, you know, how much can we get out of the rearrangement versus how much it got out of like, well, if you don't need those features. Like that filtering stuff, you don't need that. Um, so we have run that, and uh, I did a bunch of analysis on that uh, with some dtrace scripts as well. Um, so the next thing will be basically, can a combined one be as fast as fast forwarding um, for software forwarding? Uh, Mike. Uh, doing benchmarks using some of that expensive network equipment, uh, certain partners insisted that we had to aim for zero packet loss, and you insisted on like 0.1% or something. Mm -hmm. um, any comments on that? Uh, yes. So. Um, that, so the, the zero, so the question is, so a bunch of the 
people who demand these numbers demand that it's zero pack that you aim for zero pack loss, and that is not an unreasonable thing to ask, or at least near zero, zero pack loss, because then you're getting what usually is expressed as the effective forwarding rate or the effective packet rate, because it's how much you can do before the machine actually goes boom. Um, so that is a good thing to test for. I have mostly just recorded like what we're losing, or you know. You, you do the thing if you run it up, and then you run it back, and then you sort of try to get it close. Um, I think my tests are not down to 0.1. I would say it's within 5%, if I were going to guess. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's an important part of, of the set of variables to control for, is packet loss. Yeah? Um, is there any packet gen? Uh, where is that? So packet gen is in user source tools tools net map. Not that I use it a lot. <laughs> um, and if you do use it a lot, by the, so actually if you look in the, the netperf repo up here, um, you'll see there's a bunch of scripts that already use the package and stuff. It does not get built by default when you, build the, when you do build world on FreeBSD. It's a FreeBSD thing. Um, for those who've used DPDK, there's also a package gen for DPDK, written actually by an old colleague of mine from Wind River, um, which also does a similar job using DPDK if that happens to be something you're, you're using in-house. I'm using FreeBSD, I use a lot of NetMap. Um, I've, lo I've looked at the DPDK TK stuff and I will probably use it for other things. Um, also, I've done a few extensions and so has Adrian Chad to the package gen stuff in terms of like, in terms of randomizing your ports and you know, being able to do a, a few extra cool things that'll make the packets not be completely regular. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is, I assume, FreeBSD on Lynx 1 and FreeBSD on Lynx 3. Mm -hmm. How do you isolate for the possibility that it's your source of your sync for the origin of fraud? So one of the baselines we took was, and uh, if I go back, I have to go all the way back. Oh my god, I'm going to have like thumb problems. Here we go. Um, so one of the first baselines I took, which actually is not in this set of slides, is these two, right? Yeah, oh, sorry, I should repeat the question. So uh, traceability, how do I control for the fact that it might be this one or this one that's broken? By the way, one of the things we may have found is that uh, the head of the tree is a bit slower than the release and not because of debugging. So that's something else I need to trace down. And we found that by looking at what we saw here, right? So we take this out of the equation, we make this as the first baseline because we know that it's just going host to host. Um, in terms of completely taking it, the right way to, to do that is something that Olivier Couchard is somewhere, raise your hand, there you are. Um, if you look at some of the stuff that Olivier is doing on the BSD router project where he's tracking over time what happens with different releases, the graphs, those are really great. And that's kind of like the next step for this kind of stuff. So then we can say, oh, you know, head of this date, I mean, ultimately what I would like to be able to do is push a button and be like, okay, it's four weeks to release. And let's see what happens when we do the standardized tests for networking. And then we will be able to go back and be like, faster, 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 whoops. Faster, 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 whoops, right? And so it's the whoops that we're looking for. Is that what you're asking? Not quite what I meant. I meant if, if I've gone out and I've bought you know, the multi-million beer from Ixia, uh -huh. and it tells me that it's seeing you know, 9.9876543 million packets per second, mm -hmm. That's true. When I'm looking at FreeBSD, well, I've got the Chelsea hardware in this mm -hmm. case. I've got the driver from, I don't know if that's Chelsea or FreeBSD. It's from Chelsea. Well, I've got yes, FreeBSD both. Packet framework. Has anyone ever proven that the numbers that those frameworks report are, in fact, correct? Yes. Also the, also, the counters of packets in the hardware come from the hardware. So you'd be trusting Chelsea in the, in the endpoint case. But also the switch is another good point. Now, you know, the reason I'm using open source is because, I wouldn't say I'm poor, but uh, the Ixia is super expensive, right? So you are paying a quarter million base to US to get, you know, that kind of level of traceability. And if I were building a NIC card, I would probably have an Ixia. But if I'm working on an open source operating system and I want to prove that it's going faster, then I'm 
you know, unless if you have a spare Ixia, there's a lab. <laughs> Where's West? <laughs> there's a lab that way, and they would love it. Right? And then, and, and you need to pay the maintenance every year on it too, because that's not cheap. And the, yes. I really don't want to do that. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Ah. How difficult it would be to do a process recognition in this case? Uh, to run them one survey against X? Because I'm sure you do the website. Do you have, do you have interns at Verisign? If you give me an intern, I will get you repeatable tests. Um, I mean, that's what I'm working towards. But at the moment, I've been more focused on getting the tests up and then figuring out what's wrong in the kernel, because theoretically I do kernel work. Um, but I mean, that's ultimately the goal, like is to, you know, we've got QA and stuff to do uh, uh, testing of things that are easy to test, or that are testable on a single host. Um, the reason to build conductor and to probably look at, you know, DPDK also turns out to have a test framework that I'm gonna look at. Um, the folks in, Mel in Swinburne have a test framework that they've just released. Uh, you know, looking at something that makes that automatable and reportable and that people will look at um, is definitely a goal. I don't know that that'll be happened by VBSDCon, and I will not give a date on when it would happen, but, because um, you're, you're still running your test by hand, right, Olivia? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so we've automated some of it, but we haven't automated the, you know, yes, I mean, that would be great. And the other, so one of the other problems with that kind of thing, so right now we've got a test lab full of equipment for developers. Right, so like, you know, well, Navdeep's got tons of equipment, but let's say I need to look at something on the Chelsea. They didn't, turns out they don't give me a SSH into Chelsea's internal network, strangely, I don't know why not. Um, but, you know, so that lab exists mostly for kernel developers and software developers to be like, I need access to some crazy thing I can't afford. Um, let me work there. As opposed to a rack of machines that, you know, like a Jenkins kind of thing where it's like, we just run the test and then we get the results. We run the test to get the results. Um, if we had the money and the, the thing is, it's not just the money for the machines. It turns out, and I said this thing about remote hands earlier, having the hands to do the work is the hardest part for this stuff. Like, you know, you're, a, you're Cisco, right? Or you're Verisign, I don't know. You're, you're a large company that has people you can assign to this. It's a bit easier. I mean, I've worked at companies where we had a lab and we had the lab manager. And the lab manager was responsible for building that software. And they, you know, had a couple of people who worked with them. And that's a lot smoother. When it's, you know, people who are, even if it's their job, it's not that main part of their job, it's hard to get that to the point of critical mass. It's a long answer to that question. Yes? Uh, going back to the whole thing of free BSD setup, when mm. you're testing something like TCP, mm -hmm. you get interaction to oh, yeah. other TCP specs. Have you mm. ever testing? I, I have not. So one of the reasons that I'm going to put this all the way to the end, uh, one of the reasons I did a lot of the open sourcey bits other than the fact that I'm a communist, um, is, uh, or a socialist, something. Anyway, these two bits is I want other people to steal my code, right? I want people to look at what I've done in, in the NetPerf stuff in particular and either say, it's wrong, right? You know, it's like, I tried this, this doesn't work, because I really like to know if things are broken. But also just take it as examples and be like, sure, you know, I'm going to set up uh, Linux versus a FreeBSD, you know, a CentOS versus a FreeBSD, a CentOS versus a P, uh, Open BSD, a CentOS versus a NetBSD, and see how they interact. Um, and then the next step after that is kind of the, you know, the dream thing where someone drops a trillion dollars on my head and I can buy every piece of network equipment. Because my goal someday is to own every piece of network equipment. Um, <laughs> like owning all the music, you can never listen to it. Um, so the idea behind this is that I'm one developer. <clears throat> There's more than one of you out there. I'm really hoping a lot of people in this room will pick this stuff up, tell me what's wrong, send me bugs, start running them themselves, send me results. Um, anyone who starts working with this stuff, I will give you access to, you know, write access, commit access to the GitHub. You can send me pull requests. You can start putting results in if you're willing to and your company allows it. I, I'm a consultant, so my boss, though a jerk, will let me do it because it's me. Um, so that, that kind of stuff can get in there. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of stuff we could be doing, right? Like the, the list is not infinite, very long. Other questions? All right, I think my coffee has run out and so is my time. Thank you very much.